Today I'm going to be upgrading this Dell Optiplex 3010 to the max and see how much hardware I can cram into this small little box. Now these Dell Optiplex systems are super common in businesses, schools, and other mostly large deployments of systems. And in my opinion, they're just overall relatively nice to work with systems. I find this form factor to be one of my favorites for the Dell Optiplexes. It's fairly small, so you can tuck it behind or under a monitor fairly easily, and it kind of hides away compared to a mid or full size tower case. But compared to the much smaller micro units, this has quite a few more features that I find useful. A few of those include being the built-in AC power supply. So this way I can plug it directly into a wall outlet without having to have a little power adapter in there. And this connector is also typically much more durable. I've just seen less issues with these internal power supplies. I have two PCIe slots that I can put whatever I want in here. So I'm going to play around with upgrading that in a bit. And it stores a reasonable amount of IO, cooling, and internal expansion. And the great thing with this internal expansion is you can take it from a configuration like this is right now and add a lot more components to make it a pretty powerful system with a few upgrades. And that's what I'm going to go over today. I'm going to see how far I can push this guy with an upgrade. So this guy right now comes in what I'd say is a relatively normal business configuration. So it has a 500 gigabyte hard drive, an Intel Core i3 third gen processor, a DVD drive, no card slots in here, the base power supply, and everything else is about what you'd get from Dell. So let's start ripping stuff out first, and then we can take a look at what new things we can put in here. So this is the optical drive. It's a standard laptop style optical drive, which saves a bit of space compared to the larger desktop drive style drive. But it does have a full size desktop hard drive in here with a convenient toolless mount. So I have a 500 gigabyte hard drive in here right now, and the mount comes out. And then hiding under that is two memory slots. This is a 3010, so it's a relatively low end model, so you only get two memory slots. And this one comes with eight gigabytes of RAM. The higher end models give you the full four DIMM slots that the CPU support, which gives you a lot more upgrade expansion if that's something that you want to do. But these will still let you put 16 gigabytes of RAM in the system. So that's what I have right here. Two eight gigabyte DIMMs giving me 16 gigabytes of memory. The DIMMs I have here are 1333 rated DIMMs, and I'm not sure exactly what speed it'll run at, because you can't really change any of those performance settings in the BIOS on these systems, but it'll likely be fine. The one other thing to be aware of is profile. These memory sticks are right under the hard drive bay, so I have to make sure it's about the same profile. And these DIMM slots that I have here are about the same height, so it should fit in relatively well. The next thing I'm going to take a look at is the CPU. So hidden under these screws is the CPU socket. And these come with typically an i3 or i5 from the factory by default. Some of the higher end models might come with that i7. But I've actually gone and swapped this behind the scenes and put an i7-2600K, which is about as fast as you can get in this unit. You could optionally get a i7-3770K, which would be a bit faster and slightly lower power and have a couple new features but if you can get the 2600 or the 2000 series Sandy Bridge chips cheaper, it probably makes sense to go with those instead as they're not a huge difference between them. Taking a look at the biggest expansion category we have is the PCIe slots. This low end model has a 16X slot connected through the CPU and a 1X slot that goes through the chipset. And that 16X slot can let you put GPUs that you want in here, but it has a major limitation. It's a low profile slot. So if you try to put something large in here, like maybe this older full height graphics card, it's going to stick up and it's not going to fit. Technically, this could work if you don't want a side panel, or don't mind having a large hole in the side panel, but I want something that actually fits in the case and looks well. And that really limits your options for cards. A lot of cards though are like this guy here, where it has a full height bracket, but it's actually a low profile card. And if you're anything like me, you've lost this full height bracket, so what I do for a lot of my cards is just take the bracket off. It doesn't sit as well in it, but if you don't move it very much, a high profile card can easily just slot in here. It'll wiggle a little bit, but under normal use, that will be perfectly fine. And this slot gives you a lot of options. Some of those include PCI Express SSDs, like the Sun F40 I have here, a 10 gigabit network card if you want high speed networking, a SAS HBA if you want to connect to a JBOD with lots of different drives, a Wi-Fi card if you want to be able to connect it to wireless network if yours does not have a built-in Wi-Fi adapter, and then graphics cards. Graphics cards, you have a few options. One interesting option to look at here is a GT710 1X. 
And this lets you put this card in the 1x slot on the bottom and then put something else like an x4 and x8x slot in the top slot. So one example you could do is you could have, let's say, this GT710 in here, which gives you better than onboard graphics, but still far from great, and then put a 10 gigabit NIC or high-speed PCI Express SSD. That could be really nice for a server setup. And the other nice thing that the GT710 has that a lot of other low-end graphics cards don't is it has the NVENC hardware decoders. But I'm probably going to think of this more as kind of a desktop or a little bit heavier GPU compute. So here's a GT1030. This is pretty close to as fast as you can get, with the GTX 1650 being a little bit faster and about the fastest reasonable low profile option you can get in a system like this. So I'm going to slot that GT1030 um, in here. And unfortunately, that only leaves me with a 1x slot, which is going to really limit my options of what other things I can put in the system. So of the 1x slot cards I have here, I have a Wi-Fi card, but fortunately, I don't need to have Wi-Fi in the system. I could cut any of these slots here. You can just cut a little notch at the very correct spot, and then it'll go into a 1x slot. But that means you've also permanently damaged your card if that is something you want to be able to reuse, which I likely would like to. I could put my GT710 in, and that'll let me drive a total of four monitors, but I don't see myself needing that right now. So I'm not going to do that on this system. So I think I'm just going to leave the second slot empty and put the little slot backing back on this right now. Moving down a little bit in the system, here's the power supply. The stock unit in this guy is a 240 watt power supply, which really isn't that much, but for a system like this, it should be more than plenty. Now really the only thing left to upgrade is storage. This is the 500 gigabyte hard drive that came with it. And I can either put a larger hard drive in it, which I'm going to do now, or an SSD. So I have a two terabyte hard drive with one of these Dell little slide in mounts that I have. So that would give me significantly more hard drive storage. But the other thing I'd like to have in here is some high speed solid state storage. I can get a two and a half inch to three and a half inch adapter to put it in here. And I think if you really want to squeeze it in here, there actually is enough cables and spots to put two two and a half inch SSDs in these guys. And I believe Dell made an adapter on some systems for that. But the other thing I'm going to use in this case is one of these adapters. And these convert a laptop CD or DVD drive into a two and a half inch SSD. And this way I can put a one terabyte SSD in this system and a two terabyte hard drive all without giving up or using any more space or ports. And that does mean I have to give up my DVD drive, but these days I don't really use DVD drives, so I don't see that as a major issue. So now it's just time to slot all these components back in, and it almost barely fits. It's really tight on this plastic thing. So I'm just going to leave the clip unlocked for my hard drive because the RAM is a little bit higher profile. And luckily Dell uses mostly toolless parts, so I actually haven't had to pull a screwdriver out yet to work on this guy pull out the DVD-ROM drive and put in my little SSD adapter, pop this guy back in, and I'd say I have a fairly reasonable desktop system right now. It has a kind of low-end graphics card, which is far from very good performance, but it's enough to play basic games on it just fine. Two terabytes of storage and a one terabyte SSD is quite a bit of storage for a lot of uses. A 2600K is far from a high-performance modern CPU but is still fairly powerful for a lot of tasks and will breeze through doing desktop tasks just fine. And I'd say overall this is a fairly cheap system, especially if you can get these parts used cheaply or free from people who don't need this anymore. I've seen these sorts of desktops being dumped for nearly free or generally very cheap from businesses these days, as most business systems are moving away from kind of sandy bridge systems by now and are selling them, so they aren't really in use by many companies. And now that I've finished upgrading this Optiplex, I'm going to take a look at what it's capable of doing performance-wise. And because I want to do it a little bit differently, I'm going to use Ubuntu or another Linux distro to test kind of how its desktop performance is. And I'm going to run Windows Server on it to kind of see how well it works as a server, which is generally about opposite of what you normally want to do. So let's just get Ubuntu on this and see how well that works. One other thing is I'm curious how painless installing Steam on Ubuntu by default is without diving into the terminal. So you get Archive Manager or Software Install, which is a bit weird. You probably don't want to open the archive, but Software Install, I guess, kind of makes sense. Click on Software, I get a warning. I can click Install, it prompts me for a password. And it seems like it's doing something right now. And it looks like it's installed the system, so it doesn't really prompt me to open it, which would be cool, but it says Steam is available. 
Uh, something about it being out of date, press enter. So I did that. It's doing something in the terminal. This system's been pretty snappy, like desktop experience all feels pretty good in my opinion. I haven't had any crashes or weird issues. And here I am playing Borderlands 2 on this system. Borderlands 2 is a pretty old game right now, and I'm also only running it at 720p high, but I'd say this is fully playable and pretty much running at over 60 FPS all the time. I wouldn't have any issues playing the game like this. This is far from the best experience, but this is also far from the best computer. And being 10 years old, I'm pretty impressed it runs this, this well. I'm also pretty impressed at the state that Linux is. This is a Linux native game now, but it was pretty painless. I never really had to go into the terminal other than the Steam setup where I was just pressing enter a couple of times to make it go forward. And now I've changed the configuration to make it a little bit more server ready. So I changed the PCIe slot configuration so now it has a GT710 for video output, which can also do encoding if needed with NVENC. And I also put a Sun F40 in. And that's a 400 gigabyte SSD that is fairly durable and reasonably fast these days. If I take a look at Windows Server, I can see all my disks show up. This is Windows Server 2019. I believe those issues with the Sun F40 drives not working in Server 2022. So one example of things you could do with this is maybe something like Plex. Now you have hardware encoding on the GT710. You have a big hard drive to store your data and you have a boot SSD. And then you have a cache and metadata drive here. Reasonably good setup and Windows Server is a reasonable OS. It does everything you can need to do like file sharing. It's great for doing things like Active Directory, WSUS, and a lot of managing other Windows systems tools. And if you need to do Windows Server stuff, it's kind of your only option.